Hi and welcome everybody. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. I'm a bit sick. Uh, I'll try to speak very clearly and loud. My first question is who, is, who does not speak German in here? You do? You do? Ah, okay, a couple. That's okay. So we will try this in English. Um, so welcome everybody to the special session in Feminist Economics. Um, this is a special session, so it should be a bit special and not so conservative or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> um, um, so we'll have uh, quite a long time for discussion planned and yeah, we want you to interact. And um, this is recorded, so if you ask a question later on and you don't want to be recorded, just tell us and we will press the stop button. Um, <clears throat> my name is Ina Matt, uh, I will chair this session today. Uh, I also studied economics at the University of Vienna and now I also study gender studies there. Um, I am uh, also involved in some feminist projects, among those is the Frau Biel, I will say something about it later. And yeah, so um, the plan for the next 90 minutes, uh, I will first briefly say something about this session and this conference and about uh, Frau Biel. And then I will introduce the two speakers of today. And then afterwards, they will have the presentations. And then we will have an open discussion. So the presentations will only take about half of the time. And then we have room for discussions as well. Um, okay. So as you all know, in this organization of this conference, um, there were lots of people involved, among those also Frau Biel, which is a women economics, women economist group in Vienna. It was founded in 2004, and it consists of students and graduates and also professionals. Um, and we are meeting regularly um, every month. And um, so in the last years, Frau Wiel has done many different things. Um, among those, we have organized some workshops for students, for female economics students, and discussions about feminist economics. And we are also providing or trying to provide a safe space within the group to discuss our own research and other things. So um, that's like an open invitation to the women in here if you want to join us. Uh, Every first Tuesday of the month, we are meeting at Frauen Cafe at the Women's Coffee in Vienna. You can also join us on Facebook. Yeah. Oh, come to the next meeting. So, um, <clears throat> in the beginning, um, at the call for papers for this conference, there wasn't uh, the feminist economics wasn't um, named as one topic for itself at this conference, and that's very interesting, I guess because the organizers um, were discussing about it and we thought, or the organizer thought, that uh, a feminist view on economics should be a part of a pluralistic approach. And the gender or intersectional perspective should be in, yeah, in pluralistic approaches, uh, should be part of pluralistic approaches. So I guess the call for papers or the papers that were sent in showed that uh, that wasn't the case. So that the feminist perspective was missing. And that's uh, why we're having this special session today. Um, um, Alyssa later on will say something more about the relationship between pluralistic, ec pluralist economics and feminist economics. So, yeah. Um, okay, enough about that. Um, I will introduce the two speakers. Uh, first, this is Kete Knittler on my right. She is a feminist economist and studied economics here at the VU. Uh, she has been politically active in quite a lot of different projects. Besides feminist projects, she is also currently active at the Precaire Café, the Precarity Café in Vienna. That's a initiative or a group that has its roots in the Euro May Day activism. They are mainly concerned with uh, the rising precarity of workers or in the works, workers' sphere, and especially, huh? 
of us. Of, yeah, and of us as well, yeah. We are, we're all kind of precar precarious. Um, and, um, and they are also focusing on illegal workers and migrants in their work. Kate has worked in different research projects and is also a lecturer at the University of Vienna, not for feminist economics, because these courses are really hard to get and hard to be offered. I will say something later on about that as well. Together with Bettina Heidlinger, Kete published this great book. It's the Introduction to Feminist Economics, Einführung in die Feministische Ökonomie in German. It's the first of this kind in book in German, and I guess at all. I don't know. I don't know any other book that's, that does that. Uh, it was it's published in Mandelbaum Verlag, and Kete also has some um, issues here. If you wanna, uh, if you wanna buy them. So if you're interested or become interested in feminist economics, this is something you should really read. Um, the second speaker uh, today is Alisa Schneebaum. Uh, she studied economics and gender studies at Buckner University and at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. That's always hard to pronounce, Massachusetts. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And she holds a PhD from, in economics from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Yeah. Uh, Alyssa is currently a Hertha Firnberg postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Economics here at the VU. Um, she has published many articles in the fields of uh, gendered economics, uh, also distribution of income and wealth, and also economic questions concerned with uh, sexual orientation, so poverty among gays and lesbians, for example. In the last years, Alyssa has taught feminist economics here at uh, VU, which uh, is really great, and there are lots of, uh, she, and she told us that there are lots of interest, lots of interest from the student side. So one question would be, is, are there any former or Students of Alyssa here in this room? Yeah, one, two, mm. <laughs> extra credits. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and uh, in her course, she also uses uh, Kete's uh, book. So uh, you see, it all fits together. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, um, OK. So I guess my hard part is over. <laughs> and um, I will now give Alyssa the word, and you will start with your presentation. So. Cool. Uh, it's so nice to see so many people here. I thought for sure with the weather and all. It wouldn't work, but it did. So great. Welcome. Um, yeah, so as Ina told you, um, I'm going to talk about feminist economics. What is feminist economics? What I think a lot of us have heard of something called feminist economics, but a uh, few of us can come up with a definition of what that might be. Um, and talk about its relationship to pluralist economics. Huh? So that's my goal for today. Um, to look at the foundations of feminist economics, what is this whole thing about? Uh, to show also some kind of popular examples of what might be considered feminist economics in economic research and maybe activism today to get a sense of how this whole thing works. Um, and talk about the relationship with pluralist economics, which I think is not so straightforward um, or problem-free. So, but we'll get to that, and it will be exciting. So, okay, um, I also put in a slide here, this week, uh, a really foundational feminist economist, Barbara Bergman, who had been alive since 1927. She passed away this week, and I thought, I can't talk about feminist economics without mentioning her. Uh, in this context, and I wanted to read two quotes uh, of hers, which I think really say something about her and feminist economics and pluralist economics. So the first is, uh, true anecdotes, so true stories, may well contain more valuable information about the state of things in the world than do economists' theories, which are by and large nothing but possibly untrue stories made up by economists sitting in their offices with no factual input, whatever. So she really is critical of this idea that economists just kind of make up models and tell some stories without actually talking to people and finding out what real life experiences are about. And that economics is very sort of separate from sociology, from anthropology. And she was, has been critical of this for decades. 
And this I find really interesting. Um, just a couple of weeks, 10 days before her birth, oh, her birth, her death, um, she sent an email to the LISSER, the International Association for Feminist Economics, LISSER. And she wrote, she wrote this, unfortunately, quote, the profession is not really interested in rescuing economics from being a minor branch of mathematics and converting it into something more resembling a science. One who is doing work in line with what is needed is Truman Bewley of Yale. When I asked him whether he, was in, whether he was training students to do that kind of observational research, he said, no, that would ruin their careers. <laughs> so I wanted to bring that in uh, and point it out as a feminist economist who I think is thinking and doing work very much in line with uh, pluralist ideas that economics as a science has been missing a lot of crucial parts of reality uh, and that it's dangerous and precarious for <laughs> economists to try to expand economics because it kind of <laughs> makes it difficult to have a career. So I wanted to mention these things uh, sort of in her honor. Okay, good. So um, I will get started then on my take on feminist economics. My first slide is uh, titled, Not a Slide Called What is Feminist Economics? Um, that would be kind of the logical start, um, but it's very difficult to answer the question, what is feminist economics? If you ask 10 feminist economists what they think feminist economics is, you will probably get 10 more or less different answers. So I thought instead of just telling you what I think, I would go back in the literature and see what are the foundations of feminist economics, what is the core here, and then from that we can build what is feminist economics today, right? But what are the main issues in feminist economics? Um, and I picked out two quotes to talk about the sort of two issues, the two core things that I think are important, the foundation of feminist economics, and I'll talk about each in detail. But here's a quote, a kind of preview. The first is, before the 1960s and the rise of the women's movement, women's experiences in households and labor markets had been completely ignored by mainstream economists. So that's the first issue. Women were not present in economics, either as economists or as uh, the thing that economists were studying. Okay, so that's the first problem. Women were not present. Big problem. Huh? Second big problem. Quote, we want to retain and improve economic analysis by ridding the discipline of biases created by the centrality of distinctively masculine concerns. And what I will explain is that feminist economics is critical of economics as a science because it is biased in very masculine ways. Okay? That economics is problematic in how it sort of does its work. And the feminist perspective on how the work is done is that it's distinctively masculine. Okay? So we'll talk about that. So just to preview, those are the two issues. Okay, the first issue that uh, women's lives are ignored. Uh, and I, my two students have seen this slide. And so, but, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but I like the play on the word ignorance because it has ignore. Yeah. Economics was ignoring women, but it's also ignorance. It's really dumb mm -hmm. <laughs> to do that. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the language English speaker. Awesome. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm just gonna run through this. Um, the main, a main interesting point here is that economists always thought of women and women's work as primarily in the household. Huh? That's what sort of women did. They took care of the house, they took care of the kids. For a very long time, that was the idea. But what's really interesting to note is that even when economists did that, they constructed ideas of how household work was done and what it meant for women's economic lives, which were completely strange <laughs> and unrealistic. For example, um, new home economics, that's this thing that came really from Gary Becker and the University of Chicago. There we have a theory where we say, okay, how do people make decisions about which work they want to do? 
And it's like this, even if men and women are completely equal in their ability to do paid work, for example, or do household work, they have, there's no comparative advantage, they're both equally good. Well, at some point, the woman's gonna get pregnant. So even if it's just a few days, or a few weeks, or a few months, or a few years, she is, because of this biological fact, she's going to get better at housework and care work. And the man is going to develop a comparative advantage in paid work. And thus, it's very rational to understand that that's going to happen and to just invest in the field where you're going to have the comparative advantage. Period. <laughs> this is the theory of new home economics, and it, um, it's rational, and it sounds a lot like <coughs> economics, um, but it certainly ignores a lot of uh, the circumstances of that, well, uh, maybe the man doesn't want to invest and be the main breadwinner, or maybe the woman doesn't want to be the main home caretaker. Yeah? Um, and just saying that it's efficient and that's what they should do really ignores sort of social constraints and institutions that make the, maybe people don't want to do that. Okay, there are other things, bargaining models in economics, maybe you guys have seen this in your studies. Bargaining models started in very interesting ways where we wanted to know how does a couple make decisions and the very first models and still many in the literature papers that are being published today still use models where the authors assume what's called a unitary utility function where the household has one utility function that means every person in the household has the same preferences and the same way that they need to maximize their utility which is a really strange idea because you all live in households, or you have at some point, or you will at some point, and not everybody has the same preferences. Yeah? And so ignoring that fact really ignores some gender issues. Yeah? So, okay, these are just examples of um, that even though economics said, hey, yeah, women are in a household, they totally had strange ideas about how households work. Um, yeah, good. When we think about the history, the his story, <laughs> of economic thought. <laughs> okay. If you think about the, how, the history of economic thought, um, there's some really interesting research in feminist economics about this, uh, and we see that there are a few assumptions that really come out of classical economics, classical political economy about, about women and how they are in the economy. Namely, first, all women are or will be married. All women have children. That is a standard assumption in classical political economy. Two, all women are and ought to be economically dependent on men. Three, women are and ought to be housewives. They have the biological comparative advantage. Four, women are unproductive in the industrial workforce. And five, women are irrational and unfit as economic agents. Okay. These are <coughs> standard assumptions that come up in classical economics. Okay? So I'm talking about the first books, you know, Marshall, Edgeworth, Figo. That's what we hear about women. Okay, so from the emergence of economics as the science that we know today, or at least the foundations of the science that we know today, this is how women were understood, uh, which is strange. So um, that is all to say that Women's lives are largely ignored by economics. Even today, even today, there are a lot of papers, for example, on gender gaps in income or time spent working or whatever. And very often in economics, uh, what I see when I read these papers is that gender is considered something that's a dummy variable. Yeah? Let's put in a dummy variable and mix and call it so. Awesome, we're talking about gender. Great, how progressive. But uh, we have to understand women's economic lives as more as a dummy variable and understand a lot of the institutions that put men and women in the economic positions that they're in today. So a lot of the work today that's being done on so-called gender economics, I would say, is not feminist economics because it doesn't study uh, power relationships and history and sociology and psychology and all of the things that determine 
what makes women and men's lives the way that they are in the economy. Okay. That was issue one, the, uh, that women's economic lives have been kind of ignored in economics. Good. Here comes point number two, and this is a little bit trickier. Um, so I will try to explain it well. <laughs> point number two is that economics as a science, and this has nothing to do with the economy as the thing we go out and spend money and whatever. Economics as a science is uh, biased in masculine ways, ways that we can consider from a social perspective masculine. Okay. How can we think about this? Well, let's think about what's in the core of economics, so what's the stuff that gets published in AER, in, in QJE, in, in things that are considered good economics. Yeah? In the core of economics, what we see are studies of the public, public issues, markets, and government. We see individual agents, and we see efficiency as an important goal. The methods that we use, mostly uh, analytical models or econometrics. One could describe them as rigorous, precise, objective, scientific, detached, mathematical, formal, general. These are characteristics from a sociological and linguistic point of view, which are typically ascribed to masculinity. Okay? If you think about what is masculinity and what is femininity, femininity has nothing to do with rigor, uh, or objectivity, <coughs> or scientific. Femininity is more so related, and emotional, and concerned, and malleable, and flexible. Okay? These are uh, particularly masculine issues. In the periphery of economics, stuff that uh, often isn't even considered economics, but instead considered sociology very often, we see uh, studies of the private, so the family, for example, uh, studying society and institutions or equity as a main concern, a main outcome that's interesting. Uh, methods that are intuitive or vague or subjective, and so here I'm thinking of things like uh, interviews or observational studies. Uh, this <coughs> is not considered mainstream economics, and these things are socially linguistically considered feminine. Okay? So these things about economics, that economics only wants to see this kind of work, yeah, and is ignoring or not giving much credit to this kind of work, has a gender component in that this stuff is distinctively masculine, socially. And this stuff is distinctively feminine. And so economics as a science <coughs> gives credit to the masculine stuff, the hard stuff, the tough stuff, the objective stuff, and sees this kind of relational, talking, emotional, whatever stuff that matters if we want to understand the economy, it's feminine in the sense of how we understand socially masculinity and femininity, and that's the stuff that economics is not. We don't want that, yeah? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, and that's also assumptions, it's the same point. So. Um, Here's the interesting thing, right? Feminist economics are critical of the narrowness of what economics as a discipline thinks is good work. <coughs> That's clear, right? So, hey, it's not okay that we only want, that you only want econometrics, that you only want uh, analytical models. But the thing is, those critiques are pretty parallel to the pluralist understanding. Of economics, as far as I can tell, right? That this thing that economics is only interested in metrics and only interested in certain th types of analysis and fields of analysis, uh, that's very parallel to the pluralist critique. And what's unique to feminist economics in that regard is that feminist economics says, yeah, that's all really bad. Not just is it, not only is it bad, but it's also definitively uh, ranking masculine characteristics over feminine characteristics. So they give a sort of gender lens to the same critiques that we already have in pluralism. Okay? So gender specific critique. Good. Um, what, where does this problem come from? Why is economics so uh, 
bad in some ways. And one really obvious and important explanation is that economists as a group are pretty homogenous. Yeah, these are middle-aged white guys, yeah? uh, upper class. Right? And if you have such a homogenous group, you only get certain perspectives because very often people from one group have similar perspectives and experiences. And so by sort of excluding other perspectives, other experiences, you're missing out on a lot of information about the world. If economics really wants to study how the economy works, and that's for everybody, then it needs to not just hear the perspective of this group of people, and the understanding of this group of people. So it's really interesting because economics is all like, yeah, we're a super objective science. Uh, we're really hardcore about that. We don't get involved in, in emotions or in anything. We're really objective. Yeah, but it's, it's a false objectivity, and it's only a very soft objectivity because it's only one group of people, a very restricted group of people who's doing this analysis. So a harder objectivity, uh, a more thorough objectivity, would involve opening the group of, anal of analysts, getting more perspectives. That would make economics more objective, not less. All right, here are more ideas about how the economy is. Okay, good. Um, I will run through in like two minutes, I promise. Chair. Don't, yep, don't worry. <laughs> A couple of um, examples <coughs> of uh, current feminist economic issues. Um, the care economy is a huge topic in feminist economics. The idea there is care work, work of taking care of other people, is really, really important. Uh, nobody would be alive if nobody cared for them, right, from day one. From nine months before day one, <laughs> or ten months, I don't know how the whole thing works. But, <laughs> um, and, and that work, that caring work, is disproportionately done by women, so okay, no wonder that it was feminist economists who one day said, hey, this is a, a, lot, a lot of what women are doing, we need to understand this as an economic category. Yeah. Interestingly, um, this has also a lot of pluralist sort of interest in it, if we think about how do we assign a value to care work? That, I think, is a pluralist issue, right? Because we need to understand how different work, first, what activities are work and good for the economy, and how do we value them, right? We shouldn't just take prices from the market as our way of understanding what something is worth. And hopefully you guys are all on this pluralist economics train, and you all see that also. Okay, and care work is a really great example of when and why we shouldn't just take market prices as a valuation of an activity. Um, yeah, also, should care be a good that's allocated by the market only? Yeah, I think pluralist economics and feminist economics were critical of the market as the main allocational mechanism. Yeah? Care work, should, it, should you only get to care for a child or an elderly person or whoever if you can pay for it? So feminist economics and pluralist economists, I think, are critical of the market being the only mechanism to allocate goods and services. OK, good. That was example one. Example two, gender and development, um, so macroeconomic development. Something I, I really, I'm not a macroeconomist, um, just so that's clear, so I won't pretend to be an expert here, but one of the best books I ever read in economics was a book by Nyla Kabir, and she wrote a book about economic decisions of women who came from Bangladesh and lived in London. And she talked really clearly and, and, and uh, yeah, clearly, um, and told a really great story about how much these women's backgrounds, their social backgrounds, their cultural backgrounds, their religious backgrounds, influenced their labor market decisions and what that meant for the economy of London. And I thought, of course, right? Of course our economic decisions are influenced by our cultural upbringing and our social upbringing. But books like that make that really, really clear in really uh, nice ways. And I think it's a great example of uh, feminist economics and pluralist economics looking at a lot of things matter in the economy and in our economic decisions. Okay, that was a quick example. Last example. Um, 
the labor market, uh, that's really hard for me to keep short because I'm a labor economist, but basically feminist economics and I think also pluralist economics wants to see labor market decisions are not just kind of an abstract objective market allocating who works and for how much, but that there are a lot of decisions that go into who does what kinds of work. Right? There's sociology uh, that says, um, yeah, women should only be good at this, men should only be good at this. Yeah. If you want to be an engineer, you're probably a guy, because that's how guys are socialized and how girls are socialized. Um, so, so sociology matters a lot here, psychology matters a lot here in our labor market decisions. Uh, biology, some would say, mark, are, matters a lot in our labor market decisions. Okay, so we got to pull information from lots of different fields to understand labor economics. Okay, good. We could talk about a lot of stuff, but uh, we won't. But we can. Good. Uh, here's my last slide. Um, namely, a specific or articulated discussion about the relationship between uh, feminist and pluralist economics. And here's how I see it. Like I said, I think that there are a lot of similarities of the core arguments or complaints about mainstream economics from, the, from both sides. That economics totally ignores a lot of important parts of reality. Huh? Um, one of the major differences is that feminist economics does that explicitly from a feminist perspective and, and sees the whole thing from uh, a gender issue. So economics is really interested in sort of masculine stuff and ignores feminine stuff. Okay? So we could talk about is that good or bad, right? Because we already have this critique from pluralism, this critique that economics is ignoring a lot. So maybe it's just polarizing to talk about things from a gender perspective. Uh, maybe we don't need that anymore. Okay, could be, we'll talk about it. But remember the first issue, the first of the two core issues of feminist economics, namely that economics ignores or is very, very bad at understanding women's economic lives. That's still the case, and uh, I fear, and from what I know and what I've read from the pluralist movement, my impression is, and I'm open to you guys convincing me of something else, uh, but also the program of this conference, as Ina told us, suggests that it's the case that even pluralist economics is ignoring uh, women's economic lives and gender-specific issues. Huh? Uh, it's still an issue, guys. Women still earn less than men. Men and women still do different kinds of work. You know, we're not post-feminism. We're not post-sexism. Not yet. I hope one day we will be, and I don't need a, need a job anymore because it won't matter, but it still matters. Uh, so we shouldn't ignore what's missing in economics in our analysis and understanding of gender. Okay, so um, that's a kind of critique of pluralist economics. Um, from what I see so far, there's still time to change. So if you guys are working on pluralist economics, there's still time to include gender in a meaningful way. Uh, and I hope that we all will do that. Great. Okay. <coughs> Great, thanks Alyssa. There were so many issues raised already in this first input. Please uh, hold back your questions because the second input will follow, which is, which also be very interesting. Uh, yeah, write them down that you don't forget them. We will have time to discuss. I hope all questions. Yeah. Ah. Off? Um, view. Now, Mathis, so. And I have only one slide with that. Um, yeah, for the preparation for the day, we got some questions which the group of the Frau Weil prepared. So some of them 
were now covered by Alisa, and I took some others, but I thought that it also could be interesting to answer one of the questions, or that one of the questions is answered for both of us, also I will be short, and this is the question, what is feminist economics, so how can it be characterized, and for me it's basically three different levels, which almost all feminist economists at least somehow cover, and this is first of all two different levels of analysis and, and, analysis and critique. It's in German, but the words in English are very similar, so you can guess <laughs> what does it mean in English. And the first level of analysis and critique is to criticize all the theories which exist, almost every different kind of economic theory, and it ranges from Marx to neoclassic over Keynes, and probably a lot of things which are now covered under this big umbrella called pluralist economics. And what is criticized, Alisa has mentioned a lot of the parts, and they could be summarized and to show what are the blind spots of all these theories. And one of the biggest spots is this unpaid um, domestic work and labor. And for example, in Austria, the unpaid labor, it amounts for half of all the hours which are worked every year. And in other countries which are less industrialized, it's even more. And during the crisis, the unpaid labor also becomes more. So if you leave out the unpaid labor, you only look at half of the world. So you miss a lot. And usually, you never pass a test if you fail to answer half of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's how economists start to think. Yeah? So it's, yeah, it's only one part of the world. And the other um, thing is the strategic, strategic silence, which means that all of all diff many different kinds of power relations are not part of the economics. And power relations, they have a lot to do with um, the process of forming gender, um, influencing, um, ex exploitation. So feminist economics say we, we, we have to see what, where, where are these theories blind and what is left out. And so that's the one level of analysis and critique. And the other level is to see what is going on in the economy. Yeah? How, how are our circumstances of living? How are men and female persons uh, placed there? And this can be done on a micro, mass, meso, and on a macroeconomic level. Usually it's much easier to do it on a macroeconomic level because then you have this dummies for men and for women. If you are going to the macroeconomic, it's much more complex but because how can we talk about engendered money, engendered international trade? So you have to think much more in broader categories and it also has the, it's more difficult, but it has the advantage that it's not so easy. So you have to, you're forced to have a more elaborated concept about how to think about feminist economics because it's not done to say this is the man and this is the woman and that's the difference between them. So that's why I'm some kind of fan of it also. Yeah, and another level would be to, see, to, to look at the topic how is um, economic policy influencing our lives. To say there is no, no such thing like gender neutral taxes or no such thing like gender neutral um, monetary policy. Yeah. And then there's also a third level which always has been part of feminist economics and which is maybe somehow out of fashion at universities. And that's this third level about U2Ps and alternatives because it always always has been or was and still is a goal to think about alternatives, to think about the post patriarchal society or even about the post-capitalist society. And yeah. That's, that's somehow a framework, and within this framework you can find a lot of different kinds of feminists. Yeah? Some are more interested in this or in that different kind of level, or are not interested in this kind of level at all. 
and oh, that's also some something which would be more interesting to have it more often discussions within feminist economics to see what the differences are, what why what what is our motivation to do our all this work? Yeah? Because it's for sure it's not the profit maximizing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, I would say that oh, this it's it's not the geschützte geschützte marker. Trademark. Yeah, <laughs> feminist economics, it, it's not a trademark where anybody has the real <coughs> right to say this is feminist economic and th th this isn't. Yeah. But yeah, it would be fun to discuss it more and also to discuss about the word feminism. What do we mean? What kind of feminism are we going to talk about if we say feminist economics? Um, and I, I would say maybe it could be the minimum level of accordance to say it's not enough to count men and women and then to say that's that's it because doing this just means not to be as stupid as, as anybody else <laughs> which is also good but <laughs> maybe not good enough for feminist economics yeah so here we we have the 19th century and here four different women which can be seen at the, as the some pioneers of feminist economics, because we do have a, a history of feminist economics, and it can be traced back to the 19th century and even further. And the problem is usually we don't hear about them, or we don't read about them, and we can't find them in the economic textbook, not in those about um, history of economics or history of economic thoughts. At least it was like that when I studied. It also would be interesting if, if there had been some changes in the main textbooks or not. Um, yeah. The woman who is the most famous one on this picture is, is her. She is Harriet de la Mille. That's the one maybe you have heard about already. And yeah, it's, it's, it's somehow it's, it's really astonishing that not even she is mentioned anywhere because oh, she, she's the Galeon's figure, the mm -hmm. most famous one. Because <coughs> here, the screen, <coughs> there she was the co-author. And it's not any kind of book, it's one of the most famous books which has been written in economics in the 19th century, The Principles of Political Economy. Here you find the other author, John Stuart Mill. And until now, the, the, all the publishing houses is that haven't corrected the authorship. So I, I wrote Harold Taylor Mill, and maybe everybody can do it in the books which can be found in the library or wherever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have one mistake less in this world. <laughs> okay, that, that was her. And it was, oh, it, it was also one aim of the first generation in the 20th century of feminist economics to discover all this history, to, to go back in history and to see who are our predecessors, whom do we owe what, who has worked about what kind of topics, what, what difficulties did they have. And it's also interesting oh, that it, it wasn't so much John Stuart Mill who was against um, that also her name is written on the book title, but uh, yeah, were a lot of reasons and social pressure why it wasn't possible. But it's another question: Why is it still today like this? Also, we know that it's it's simply wrong. And on on the left side here we have um, Jane Masset. She is she is another kind of one of the first feminist economics or maybe maybe one couldn't really call her a feminist economic because she didn't really have to do a lot about feminism and she wasn't part of the feminist movement at that time but she was just interested in it and she wanted to gain money or she needed to gain money with some kind of work and why not to write books about economics which were a really new top, also new topic at that time in, in sciences, oh, because at that time it was still developing and not settled uh, 
fixed discipline at universities at all. It was part of the moral philosophy or about in the, the law studies included. And here on the left side you see the book she wrote. It's a more modern copy, the, mm -hmm. the real old books. I didn't look them because he couldn't read the title, but they, they are real, they're made out of leather and in gold and in red and they look very valuable. And she had big problems at the beginning to find the publishing house, but when she managed <coughs> to do it, she, she yeah, managed to, or she got more than five or six editions of, of her books. So where, she where, is she, where is she from? From both are from Great Britain. Ah. So Adam Smith was the first, and all feminist economics also were in Great Britain were, yeah. So you have these conversations on political economy by Jane Mosset, and then a very similar story of another woman from Harriet Martineau, the illustrations of political economy, which also were quite successful, and both of them got a lot of recognition of all the prominent um, economic thinkers of that time, as from Ricardo, Picou, say they all acknowledge the work they have done, and of course they also got a lot of critique because it wasn't suitable for a woman to be intellectually active and to publish things. <coughs> and here we have another type of woman, it's, it's Charlotte Berkis Gilman, she lived in the United States and she was one of the most hmm, well-known and exposed feminists of the first women movement and she wrote a, yeah, one book is Women and Economics um, it's more about the economic relation of women and men and it's, it's really funny to, to read it you can find it online and yeah you also have to get used to it, but when you are used to it, you can have a lot of fun with it. And there she, she, she talks a lot about um, unwaged labor of women in the households, how are women forced to <coughs> make all this work, or to provide this work unpaid, how the um, law system is forcing women to, to do this system. And, yeah. And on the other hand, on, on the top, the forerunner, it's a literature magazine which she published and inside this she also wrote a story about the woman who left her home and then she had a big discussion and ho however, it's also possible to read it and to find it in the internet. I just put it there because if you want to write a story about feminist economics, where do you find the first economics? Yeah, because at the beginning you don't find them at universities because it wasn't their own discipline and then women had, weren't allowed to study or even much later than, than men. So you have also have to, to look at other, you, you can find feminist economics at the intersection of economics and lit literature and then there's, here is Kate Leichter, the first poly eco feminist economics or economist of Austria who also studied economy, who is not from Austria. <laughs> so can, can, maybe you can tell us later who is the first feminist economist in, in your country. <laughs> of course, it's not <laughs> only <laughs> one. Uh, there, there, there also could be named other women, but she definitely was one of them. There's also a, pr a prize named and a, and a, and a, professor, a professorship mm -hmm. named after Kitty Leister for women to support yeah. women. So yeah. she is at least one of the women who is not completely forgotten yeah, she's in Austria. <coughs> yeah, and here we also we enter the phase where neoclassics started. That's Mary, ba Ma Ma Mary Paley Marshall, the woman of Alfred Marshall. And she also thought at university and she was one of the first women in England who studied and fi finished her studies quite successfully. Yeah, and for sure she was much more conservative like mm -hmm. Harriet Dana Miller or others. But she did quite. She also looks scary. 
good and interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah, and then here, here in the middle we have somehow a break. It's oh, when when we say our our discipline started. Yeah, when w one point we, you could say it's it's one starting point. It's the um, feminist economics, w which came out in 1994. <laughs> And but that's one kind of um, economics which is really, really placed at universities. And all the topics, all topics wh wh which feminist economics deal with, they don't. They are not born at universities. They come. They, ca they come out of the street or out of the, the second fem women's movement. Yeah. The, all, all the interest in unpaid labor. What does unpaid labor mean for? Capitalism, how is it used inside capitalism? Why do we have something like unpaged labor? How did this develop over the centuries within capitalism? Why is it also a new form of kind of labor, like wage labor is something new <coughs> to all the centuries? And so we, we, we owe a lot to the, to the second women's movement, and th there are also these yeah. Maybe you can see it. the <laughs> two arrows in both directions <coughs> one going back because it was the, the, the second women movement who started to reveal our history and to rediscover it. And then there, there came a lot of input to which someone ended at the universities. Yeah? And, and th there, there's also a lot of knowledge production out of universities. And maybe then here we come to this kind or this part of what feminist economics <laughs> is or could be, it's all the networks, informal networks, more institutionalized networks of women and men who are concerned with the, this topic and are still fighting for improvement, not only about the scientific improvement, but also about what, what is our life yeah. and, and how do we want to be our life and how can we influence it as that what we have learned is economics, economists. Yeah. That's what. Thank you, Kete. So, uh, as you see, there were the two, two very interesting but two very different presentations. So I think even these presentations show the very the plural the pluralism in the you know in feministic economics. So uh, with the more historical and political perspective that Kete showed us. Now we are um, open for discussion. Yes. Yeah, I, I, will, sorry, I, I, will just, I will just collect some and then, yeah. Okay, now, firstly, you asked how is this still in university? I'm coming to Graz and women are basically completely ignored. You are from where? From, from the University of Graz. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Problem is, we never heard of Elino Ostrom, we never heard of Harry and Jane Mill, even John Stuart Mill is covered in topic really increasingly. Gender is a non-issue. We have a professor, female professor who does quite intensive work on economics of gender or gender pay gap, but there is no single course where she can anything about it, because mm -hmm. it's not in the cur curriculum. Uh, there, there would be. A, there would be. Also, we talked about it before we had the before we had the session. In at what, like, at your universities and on at which university, is there a feminist economic course at your university? That's the better question. Okay, Maybe raise your right, raise yeah. your hand if there is one. Yeah, at the VU, yeah, except VU. <laughs> well, compulsory or, or also elective, I guess. No, right. elective is okay. <laughs> Yeah, so at the, that's the University of Vienna. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, but that's, it's very, it's very interesting. Any questions? Uh, one sentence uh, you mentioned uh, feminist as a, its own discipline. So do you see uh, or feminist economics, do you see it as its own discipline or as a subfield in economics or a subfield in some other discipline? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's your understanding uh, in the way we organize our knowledge and Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Susan. I have a couple of questions. Um, I think, and this is just starting when you were kind of describing like, these femi more feminine and masculine attributes, also economics and other sciences areas of knowledge, um, and you kind of showed how you have objectivism in specific statements on one side, but subjectivism on one side, and on the other. And my question is, do you really think that this, that it's a realistic and attainable goal to demand that we make something that we prize so high as a discipline and a being objective and truth finding? that we include things like vagueness on the same level? Do you really think that's realistic? A, B, do you think it's useful? B. Um, then, a more specific question. When you talk about care work versus work, that's just like one example for a kind of work, I guess, that isn't captured in the, in the mainstream approach. But what is what then is your definition for work? Because in that sense, I could basically claim everything I do ever is work. So maybe you could specify that. Um, and I'll stick to those two questions and maybe one else. There was one, I will okay. get one more and then, oh, then we will start the first answering. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, I, yesterday, I, I came from Paris, I was at the INET conference, the conference of Institute of New York and in the Paris from a young scholar's institute, that there was a session where Julie Nelson was, was speaking. Yeah. Uh, is, is she a professor at UMass? That's what Wikipedia said, I'm not sure. Yeah, at UMass Boston. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, you must boss. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, I see. Um, yeah, well, okay, and she emphasized that um, you for it's really important to, to, to say that women and men are not as different as it is often, I don't know, put in, 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 in science. She, she compared more the difference between men and women. So suggest that they are like from North Dakota and South Dakota. Like there are some differences, but like they're not that large as, as they are often put. Like also in the day, I don't know, whatever. And and then I, I asked her a question, which she I don't know she she did which she, so because I, I think yes, one one way of maybe um um reducing or or, or of, of of reaching a more equal society is to actually say okay like that. Too much labeling of women that they are too different can 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 be really important. But like I also think that sometimes a labeling in that the, the fact that women might have different needs in the society can also be a source of of um, I mean, like an argument for change. So I, my question would be: What are chances and pitfalls in labeling women as different than men? So um, there was this question about how to put uh, feminist economics, like the discipline-wise, where would we put feminist economics? Then there was the question of uh, resolving the dichotomy in science. As such, I would like to add that's not just economics. I mean, science, if you talk about science, there is always you know, the objective and the subjective, the one and the other. So that's, uh, that's a, really a critique on science, I guess. Actually, um, and then uh, there was the other question from Rezi, uh, what is work? <laughs> no. uh, and this last one, the uh, Katis uh, asked the, uh, you know, pitfalls of uh, chances, and chances and pitfalls of essentializing uh, gender or naming gender. I don't know what, who wants to start with the dis maybe discipline question, but that would be both. For both, I guess. Oh. Okay. Um, whew, good question. <coughs> um, where does feminist e economics fit? Um, I personally see it as part of economics, particularly because it's explicitly um, reflective of and on economics as a discipline. Um, I, I don't see it as its kind of own thing, just like we don't think of macroeconomics is its own thing, and microeconomics is its own thing. It's, I think, a part of the whole that ought to be understood if we want to uh, understand the economy. 
Uh, so from a discipline point of view, I see it like that. Which, by the way, speaks to um, what I wanted to say to Gezi, who asked, is it reasonable or even do we even want something where we start thinking about vagueness or subjectivity to be part of economics? And I think to answer that question, we have to go back and ask a different question, namely, what do we want from economics? What is the point of economics as a discipline? And me, uh, I would say it is to understand the workings of the economy. Uh, who has money, who doesn't, who does what work? Uh, for how, how many hours or minutes a day do people spend and what kinds of, how do we organize our economic lives? That's the point of economics for me. And in that sense, yes, I think we need this so-called vagueness or subjectivity. I mean, I can remember when I was 18 years old and my grandmother, who was an immigrant to New York, and she paid sub her taxes her whole life, and she was 90 years old and she couldn't afford to buy cookies because they took away her whatever thing from the state. And for me, that was like, such an issue of economics. How do we organize our society that a 90-year-old woman can't buy the cookies that she wants to buy, right? So yeah, that's vague. I can't write about that in a paper. I can't do econometrics about that, right? Yeah, of course I could do an analysis and have a dummy variable for women over 90. But is that really the story of how the economy works? And, and I like that story. Not that I like that my grandma couldn't get the cookies, but I like the story because it, it brings us back to why are we doing this? Because we want to, there are reasons, there are systematic reasons why things like that happen. And for me, economics is about, is about understanding those reasons. And so yeah, vagueness, I'm all for it if we really understand more. Because guess what? Maybe like 0.5% of people in the world can read a standard non-vague economics paper uh, and get something out of it. So tell me what vague is because I think it's just as vague to produce something that people can't understand. Oh, what you, what you also mentioned in the, on your first slide, uh, the titat from, from the one economist who just died. Yeah, Bar Barbara Bergman. Barbara Bergman with the anecdote, no? I mean, an, an, act, yeah, an anecdote can be so much more than a model or, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. Right. So I'm all about vagueness in that sense. Uh, do I think it's possible in economics? I hope so. I hope that at some point we're going to realize, oh, economics, we're not doing a very good job at understanding the economy. We've got to change something. Maybe in 20 or 30 years we'll get there. As long as you know, people like us in this room keep making it clear that we need it. Okay, um, uh, I'll just finish and go through the list and then do Keita. Um, labeling women as different... Or what was your expression, essentializing gender? Uh, that's a really, really great question. And I think for as long as there are differences, it does make sense to do it. Because there are, not that I think that there's some biologically determined thing that make women one way and men one way. Even if we abstract from that to whatever extent it exists, there are social things that say men are something and women are something else. And that those prescriptions of what men and women are have consequences for our economic lives. So yes, I think it makes sense to talk about men and women. Men and women, that's a nor, it's simply what we make it. There's no such thing as man or woman. That's all what we say it is. Right? So yeah, it's important to understand what we understand from man and woman because that's all tied into how we experience the economy. So yeah, if... Yeah, if that's the idea of essentializing gender, yeah, I still think it's important because it still matters, right? Um, how to define work, last question. Um, I think, I, I guess, I thought about it for about 10 seconds. I guess work, I would define it as anything that's productive for the economy. So I don't think, I was gonna say, I don't think drinking beer with your friends is productive, but maybe it is because you have to buy the beer. I don't know. Maybe my like going for a run in the park isn't productive for the economy. That might not be work. Because you are a part of the economy and you're penetrating. Yeah, you're, you're trimming <laughs> your body, yeah? It's so arbitrary. Yeah. So like, yeah. I think this is what I was misinterpreting or interpreted differently when you said vague as yeah. a word mm. that we associate with femininity. Uh -huh. That it's undescriptive, everyone has a different interpretation for that. And so I feel like it's hard to abstract that from the economy. 
I like sit in a room even here, I think we all have a different definition for work. Yeah. So how do we come, how can we create a theory that is strong enough to, to you know, throw against mainstream theories if we can't even come to a consensus in this room? Maybe by being specific about which type of work we're talking about. We don't have to talk about all work ever. We can talk about care work in the home yeah. of little kids. Being specific and not vague. Maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think well, the, the, the question what, what is work was maybe it was one of the most revolutionary or most important questions within the second women movement and also within economics, just to say unpaid labor is work. It's not because it's done of because of love and it's not <coughs> spare time and it's not our hobby and not our leisure, it's work. And then the, a lot of discussion started. Yeah? Also, do we want to, to get this work paid on a political level and payment for unpaid labor is still a campaign dating back to the 80s and it has a wide range of who is claiming it and with what goals. Uh, the, the conservative ones who just want to stay at home and raise the, raise the children while having a well-paid man. That's the conservative side and on the other far left-wing side you had women who um, demanded money for unpaid labor in always on a higher and higher level so that it is clear it's not possible to finance it and to make capitalism crash by that. Yeah. So you have a wide range and then what work means always has been changing o over the centuries and also within capitalism. And um, also it's also the question, why is it an important question or related mm -hmm. to what is it important? To what, what we see or want to have to, to be analyzed at what is exploitation and, and how do different kinds of work, how, how are they interlinked? How do they work for capitalism? Can capitalism exist without unpatched labor? No, it definitely can't not. But why not? And how, how is capitalism including this unpaid labor? Yeah, and, that's also th then, and then you have a lot of parallels between unpatched um, domestic labor and knowledge work. It's a lot of knowledge work is unpaid out of, oh, you don't have this fixed distinction between working place and place where you live and working time and spare time, where, where do, we, do your ideas come from? Probably in the morning when you wake up or during your dreams. Is dreaming part of your work? S somehow, yes. Yeah? So, yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah, a, a starting point for going deeper into this, this discussion. And yeah, to, to the pool, I think w one of the most important things to do for economists is also to, to, to um, work more about Wissenschaftstheorie. Yeah. Science. Philosophy of science. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the <coughs> philosophy of science and of our science and to get more, to discuss more about what, what does objectivity mean or can mean. Mm -hmm. Oh, because somehow it's also a label. And is it true that economics is an objective discipline? They just state it. And they say we are close to, to natural sciences, but you have to make so many abstractions, so many assumptions, that what, what is objective on that? That's quite vague, what you leave out and what you put inside. You can argue it, but you, you have to argue it, and then you have sozusagen some vagueness or a decision-making inside, which is not a given, God-given objectivity. And, yeah, and, and there, there, had, there had been a, a lot of discussion about this formation of, of sciences, also feminist critique on it in the, from Sandra Harding going back to the 80s, which would be very fruitful for everyone. Uh, not just for feminist economics, but to, to get a bigger dis distance to his own discipline. And <coughs> what was the other questions? The, the, um, uh, the naming, naming uh, specifically naming women 
labeling labeling women and the, the last are one was the when at birth <laughs> at the age of 10 <laughs> no but how to use this concept yeah oh i think uh, at the moment we still can't avoid it because there are so many people who say feminism forget it men and women are equal so we need these fucking numbers just proof to say no it's not we still have these old disadvantages and inequalities and they do exist and then we can put them in statistics or more elaborated econometric models and all of them will tell us there are still differences so <coughs> So we, we need it, and at the same time, oh, it's also enforcing all stereotypes. If we always say it's like this, it's in, in, and it's like this on an empirical level, and also on, on how to deal with theories. So if you say the objectivity is male, it's not really male. Huh? It's just labeled to it has been designed to be the male stuff. I wouldn't say that I'm, yeah. So it's it's... Um, I think you, you, you somehow gave the answer with your questions that there are a lot of pitfalls but we can't avoid them. And the discipline, I think oh, the feminist economics has to be part of every sub-discipline but it's really hard to, to reach it, to, to put it into practice because there shouldn't be any finance sciences without some kind of gender budgeting and understanding of yeah, the underlying structures. And therefore, I think it's also good to have this special discipline with feminist mm -hmm. economics, which would deal with all these um, different levels of economics, economics also to create experts on it. Yeah? And which doesn't mean that we need it everywhere, because it's, it's not only the little extra. Do we have more questions? Uh, I fear I take the woman first. Um, I was because uh, you mentioned like um, alternatives and utopia mm -hmm. referring to feminist economics. Maybe you can just mention a few sentences uh, on that. Because my perspective, I sometimes have a feeling that which was why I very much like the, the way you were describing it from, from different topics or issues like that feminist, um, sometimes feminist economy economics is very much related to the critique of mainstream mm -hmm. and uh, what is missing but and yeah and I would be very interested in like the alternative perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question on the uh, relation between feminist economics and pluralism um, and I think especially I think the work of Felici showed that gender was really specific developed in the title capitalism <coughs> this paid and unpaid labor and I think then I think it's the question if feminist economics are, are is it necessary that they are also always a critique of capitalism in it and then it's linked to the question also if then pluralist economics should be also always critical of capitalism I think which is it definitely not now but I think if, if, if it's really I was curious about the interrelation to demography and population economics. The field is growing more and more and is basically co-opted by neoclassical peers and it would need, it would mm. definitely be great to have a feminist invasion. 
Die letzte von, von da war noch eine noch eine Frage. Yes, um, if you look at the problems of gender from a sociological perspective, uh, you see that it's very different, very vague, like power, socialization, culture, segregation on the labor market, etc. And I wonder, are all those things basically ignored in economics because? the main methodology of economics is simply not fit to really capture those things because, well, let's face it, I reject the idea that you can put something like segregation of culture in a bloody formula. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, we are, we are, the, the time is running out. Uh, we will probably take longer, so, um, yeah. But if you're still interested, stay. <laughs> But I guess because we are short on time, we will just like one person answers the question each. Um, so uh, start with utopias and alternatives. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. There are much more than I can tell now, but for example, um, Henriette Taylor Mill, she, she was in favor for something quite similar, which would be called today the unconditional basic income. And oh, she also started more conservative, but then because of the revolution in Europe in 1884, she um, became more radicalized and took up ideas from the um, utopian socialist and thought about workers' cooperatives, but workers' cooperatives not only in the real production of some products, but also workers' cooperatives and common housing and making all the housework together. Oh, both ideas, they have a lot of big strengths, uh, big continuities till today, all concerning housing, of alternative ways of how to organize, now we would say care or social reproductive work. And um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, she also wrote some fictional utopian ro novels, which are also one, another kind of, of reference. And then you always find the big discussions between um, reforms within capitalism, or do we need to go beyond it? And the, the bigger utopias are the second ones. And that's I think I think the now capital capitalism the next you know keyword uh, so the relationship uh, feminist economics and pluralism and uh, a critique on capitalism um, is feminist economics always critical towards capitalism and should pluralist economics also be that or yeah as a for yeah you can who, concerning all those people who call themselves feminist economics, not, of all, not all of them criticize capitalism. Yeah. But it also depends what you understand on feminism and, and what, um, <coughs> for example, in Sweden, feminism has a less negative connotation than in Austria. So there are much more persons who call themselves feminist economists mm -hmm. because it's not the stigma to call oneself feminel no. Feminist. There's also a feminist party in Sweden. There's a feminist party yeah. in Sweden, so you find <coughs> Sweden feminist neoclassic economics, which probably you would not in Austria or depending. For, for me, it, it definitely is part of it, because wh why else should we make all this work? But that's, that's my opinion. Huh? Um, real quickly, my answer to these first two questions is very much related. So first, utopias. Um, I, I haven't thought about it so much, but something that comes up immediately for me is that I think that there's a huge amount of imposition of gender and gender roles and gender ideology 
put upon people and that really restricts our personal freedom of who we uh, can be in society. And I think a utopia would get rid of this really strict gender uh, roles and mechanisms. Um, and then that's related to me, uh, to capitalism for me. Uh, Again, not every piece of work in feminist economics is critical of capitalism. I, I think that all good economists, no matter what sort of umbrella they put themselves under, should be critical of capitalism, not, not in the sense that they should dislike capitalism, but that they should be critical of the structure of the world that we live in, the choices that we made of how we organize our economy. These are choices. Capitalism is a choice, right? And we should be critical of our choices from different perspectives. Uh, and in that sense, I think that good feminist economics and good pluralist economics should be critical of capitalism. And the relation to the utopian capitalism, I, I very much think that um, part of this very strict gender binary existence com comes in many ways because capitalism needs that. So. Yeah, there's the relationship. Yeah. Um, maybe just to, to this more practical question, um, how do we deal with topics which don't fit into formulas? Like, mm. Because it's definitely true, you can't put everything which you want to answer in a, in yeah. a formula. But why do we only stick to formulas? Huh? We have a wide, wider range of instruments how to analyze them, yeah. and that's also our instruments as economics, economists, and the other thing is also, and oh, it's, um, it's also how you interpret your formulas. Yeah, you, you get something out and then you, you build always, you build up a story around it and the story can m much bigger than only the core explanation <coughs> of this formula and that's, that's something which, which we can do. Maybe and putting yeah. things gender segregative in a formula doesn't mean that we have a useful outcome or there are so many stupid things done which are declared to be gender sensitive and we think, oh, no, fuck it. Maybe you could just, uh, Lisa, maybe you could say something uh, concerning that and an intersectional or possible yeah, intersectional, exactly. intersectionality or intersectional view on yeah. economics. Yeah, and, and I just want to say the austerity question I'm going to leave open. Yeah. That's definitely something you're a lot better with, so... I will leave that to you. Yeah. But um, the intersectional thing, can we ignore race? Can we ignore ethnicity, whatever? No, of course not. And I think feminist economics is um, very good at recognizing the importance of these categories, um, much better at least than many other fields. Uh, but it's difficult within economics because a lot of this comes down to telling stories, um, which our methods in economics are not very well designed to do, but of course it's important. Um, uh, demography and population economics, I, I think that's a good invasion. Feminist economics would invade that well. Um, I would be interested in hearing what you think feminist economics could bring to the table there. Uh, yeah, because I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah, I'll stop. Oh, maybe, I mean, I just have to say, I mean, there, there has been lots of critique on demography and population science co coming from the feminist movement and the feminist science critique already. And so, I mean, just, um, just, just let me add that I think feminist economics can be a part of, or is a part of economics, but it's also part of gender studies. So, and I think that the, the critical gender perspective or intersectional perspective that's where also economists can learn from gender studies and the other social and cultural sciences. So, um, yeah, that's, I just want to add that. Kita, yeah. you want to say something to concerning the, the meso level, maybe? Um, no idea. I never really worked about the meso level, but I, I know that it was, or oh, that a lot of feminist economics worked with it just because also they were interested in because it was just in between the micro and the macro level and also important to get institutions included in theories and not only these individual beings. So, okay. And uh, the alternative to austerity is no austerity. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess because we are already we are already very late 
Um, I will tell you again, please read this book. I think there is also there's a very interesting debate about care work as well. Um, and maybe also austerity politics, I'm not sure. A little bit about austerity politics as well. You can buy one of your copies here. It costs... Uh, it spends 10 or 12 euros. 10 or 12 euros. Um, and please, uh, for all of you who are interested, uh, come join Frau WL on Facebook or write down on the list that Heidi holds in her hand here. That's our information list. Um, thank you very much for the interest. It was really nice. And have a good afternoon and good weekend. <laughs>